And we're back with uh, Michael Gombeski, a New York Times bestselling author and a former staff sergeant for the Marine Corps. Uh, so before we left off, you said you're, you know, getting pushed into one of these schools uh, by the Marine Corps and that MARSOC was, was hurting for people. So I guess the question would be, what was it like going through the, the Joint Terminal Attack Controller course? Like how uh, much of that you can say? The, the course, the course is is pretty laid back. I mean, I, uh, if I remember, the course was about three or four weeks long, uh, and I did it up in Norfolk. Uh, and at that point, it, it was a naval. It's a naval course, and up to that point, it had only been officers. So it's it's usually full of pilots. So it's it's pretty laid back. I, I remember when I went through my class, I was only one of two enlisted guys I'll there. I was going to ask you is how many enlisted yeah. people were there. Yeah, it was, it was me and, and another and another Marsoc uh, enlisted guy going through. Uh, but the school is laid back because it's one of those things where it, it's one of those skill sets where they can't you can't be force fed it. Like you can't you can't be taught to be good. You have to have a certain level of just ability to do it uh, to be effective. You know, some people can do it and excel at it, and other people just they'll just never get it. Uh, so it, it's a very it's one of those those uh, skill sets. It's real finicky on on who can actually do it properly and do it well. Um. So if I could just back up real quick. So you say you got selected by Marsoc. Is that is that right? They they selected you to come to them, or how did that work? Uh, no. Basically, the way it works is, uh, you know, they stood up the battalions, and uh, the requirement from SOCOM was for every team to have a, you know, a joint terminal attack controller JTAC, and the Marine Corps is like, whoa, we can't give up that many Air Force or uh, Marine Corps pilots. You're gonna have to take enlisted, and you know, fire support guys were the the prime one for it. Uh, so basically, the we call them monitors. They're the ones who basically handle personnel like movement and shifts around the Marine Corps. Uh, there was just this huge pool for it because there was all these empty slots. So, you know, they were coming, the guy saying, hey, they really need you. And it was all volunteer. Like, they couldn't say, hey, you're going to MARSOC uh, because it was outside of the Marine Corps. Uh, you know, it's not officially. Right, it's underneath it's, US it's, SOCOM. It's, yeah, it's under SOCOM. So, they had to, you know, they were looking for volunteers. What was, what and, was that uh, like when you were like, I can join US SOCOM? Were you like, F fuck yeah, let's do well, it? Well, I mean, up to that point, I mean, Marines had no, we had no real. Uh, you know, insight or, or experience working with with special ops because we just we do our own magtaf thing. We support right. ourselves it's like force recon and stuff, which was already yeah. part of the Marine Corps. Yeah, so that that's that's you know force reconnaissance and recon. That's about as special ops as it got. Uh, so it was really this big unknown, and and you know Marsoc wasn't even fully stood up yet. Uh, so it was kind of an exciting time to go there because you really didn't know what it was going to be like. All you knew is it, it wasn't going to be like being in the infantry anymore, which just at that point, you know, with all the Iraq deployments just sucked. There's like, there's got to be something else out there. Um, so I'm assuming, you know, you go through the, the Joint Terminal Attack Controller course at Norfolk, and then you did you have to do your own, uh, what is it called, like uh, supplementary training to join MARSOC? Uh, we just have the basic, we have a basic uh, assessment that we have to do. I mean, you have to be of a certain physical standard right. uh, and all that to get into. Uh, but we're primarily there. So like us and EOD and uh, canine dog handlers and, and even some radio and uh, comms people, uh, we, you know, we're like specialty jobs where, you know, that we'll, we'll just find the best ones there are of this and then we'll send them to MARSOC. Gotcha. So you didn't really have to do, because I know like uh, people who joined to become MARSOC, to become critical skills operators, need to go through, you know, the assessment and selection. They need to go through uh, ITC, which is uh, individual training courses. For yeah, so so we did, so when I was in, we didn't even have that. There was no assessment okay. and selection. There were no uh, CSOs or anything. Everyone who was currently in MARSOC was grandfathered in from Force Recon. Right, they just grabbed everyone they could. And... Yeah, it was, it was the Wild West. It was the very, like, you know, the first two years uh into the whole marsoc thing that's <laughs> so yeah it was it was different you know it was uh you know just kind of feeling our way in the dark and and trying to figure things out with with you know them with us uh, ocom throwing a bunch of money at us for our budget and 
we're like, finally, we get decent gear issued to us. I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure coming from the Marine Corps, you're like, wow, we get a budget? That's insane. I can't believe that they're uh, giving us money to use. Yeah, it's like, oh my god, you're going to give me a backup weapon? That's so awesome. <laughs> What's the old Marine Corps saying? Like, uh, Marines make do? Uh, Marines, uh, the Marine Corps has been doing so much with so little for so long. We're now authorized to do anything or everything with anything. <laughs> um, just because, uh, you know, I'm a nerd, I'd like to talk on that. Like, what was it like? Like all the all the cool weapons and shit you got to deal with in Marsoc, uh, like with your Marsoc attachment. You know, it, it showing up at the battalion. I mean, it was just like uh, pretty much every battalion, but you could tell the atmosphere was was a little was a little different. It was it was kind of had had more of a uh, you know big boy rule type of vibe. And uh, I, I remember just going into supply uh, because I had to check out of like the regular supply, Marine Corps supply, and they like took everything from me. Like I literally walked out of that. Uh, we called it SIF, Central Issuing Facility, or something like that. And uh, I like literally walked out with like a canteen and and your camis, a, a, poncho, <laughs> a poncho liner, and like my gas mask. Wow! And as they took everything, I'm like. I'm like, so they're going to give me everything, right? They're like, yeah, they'll, they'll take care of you. They'll give you all your stuff. I'm like, you're positive because you just <laughs> took everything that I have. They're like, no, they have their own supply chain over there. They'll, I'm like, okay, okay. But if they don't, I'm coming back here and getting my, you know, get my shit back. Uh, but <laughs> I, but I personally would have been like, man, this is my shit that I've had for, you know, for years. I kind of, I don't want to give this yeah, up. Yeah, but, 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 but in the same breath, you're like, man, just take it. Just it's all get over with. It's all it's all exp it's all expendable. Uh, but you know, going you know, checking into Marsoc, there's like this huge checklist. You just go into supply. They literally give you like a shopping cart, and they're like, they're just tossing in all this high end stuff. I was like, oh my god! I'm like, this is all for one person. Uh, <laughs> Enough that would usually hold for like an entire squad. Oh, oh yeah. You get for oh, one person. E e yeah, easily. I, I just I just couldn't believe, and you know, like the quality of the gear, and they're like, hey, what size boots do you wear? Okay, here, take this one. These are these are for cold weather. These are for, I mean, they actually outfitted us for like different climates, and it's just completely different from what you know typical Marine Corps issue is. Uh, it's, it's just completely different. And then uh, you know, going over to the armory, you know, you, I'm expecting to get like a weapon checked out to you, but they they hand you a gun box and you you open it up to inspect it and there's like you know there's like two lower receivers three uppers of different barrel lengths suppressors wow. three types of optics you know a 45 That's... sidearm you're like oh, and so awesome. as, as, as i'm as i'm like looking through the box i'm like i'm like all this is mine they're like yeah that's that's your gun kit I'm like, gun but all, kit? but all, yeah, but, <laughs> but, but all of this, like, all this stuff that's in here, this is all mine. It's like, yeah, it's a standard issue. I'm like, oh my god, this is totally different. <laughs> see, I, I, maybe you can answer this question because you see in like movies and TV shows and shit like that where, uh, you know, these dudes are all equipped with like their own different gear and stuff like that. How much of that is true? Like, are you allowed to say? purchase and procure your own i don't know pistol or yeah. whatever or uh not not firearms so 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 a lot of the guys find gear that works for them when it comes to personal gear yes there's a lot of flexibility that the only thing you can't skimp on is say uh uh protective gear so like you couldn't buy your own you know smaller plates gotcha. uh, to wear or 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 a different type of helmet that you know was cut higher uh or a personal weapon, so no personal weapons and no skimping on, you know, issued uh, armor, body armor, stuff like that. But everything else, like pouches or the type of vest you want to wear, I mean, it's really, it's really up to whatever works for you. That's that's the big difference between Marsoc and the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps is very, okay, you know, by the numbers, everybody dress right dress, and the special ops side of the house is more of, okay, well, what works for you? as an individual and your specific job um which is totally foreign to a marine right at, right at, it's at, like the, i have at, a i have a choice excuse me <laughs> yeah at, 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 at that time at that time during you know the, the marine corps and and the the war you know that was just completely foreign like somebody's asking me what i think <laughs> um so I guess my question would be like, how do you, how come you see some guys with like uh, the ACHs, like I know you wore, I saw photos be wearing it, and then some guys with the the fast helmets. 
Is that just armor? Just uh, out, well, or... like, no, it it really depended on what uh, what was available when they got when they were issued. Uh, I know some guys actually just go out and buy their own helmets. I mean, as long as it's a as long as it's a, a legit helmet, uh, you know, guys were doing that. Right. Like I said, just as long as it wasn't like skimping, like you couldn't wear, uh, you couldn't wear like a tank helmet. Right. You know, that had that has the high cut the high cut ears for headphones and stuff like that. You couldn't wear something like that. Yeah, I've also seen. I don't know if you could answer this or not, but like, uh, you know, I see you were issued the forty five. I think it was like the M forty five, you know, sidearm, and um, but then you'll see some operators with like Glocks or like Sigs. Oh yeah, yeah, Th- those come from the armory. They came from the armory too. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because because those are those are in the, uh, those are in the SOCOM arsenal. Gotcha. And you know the the forty fives are good, but they're big weapons, and and depending on what the the job is, you know you need a smaller profile uh, pistol. Um, all right. So just pass the gear, because I'm sure nobody else, you know, besides me and some other people, care about care about gear. Um, so you you know you show up, you you finish your I guess Marsoc selection, you finish your JTAC course. What next? You get assigned to I'm assuming a, a battalion, right? Yeah, that's uh, well. Initially, that's where you get you get assigned to a battalion, and then as soon as you go to the battalion, that, that's where you do your check in and everything. And then right from your battalion, they say because there's there's no real home for you at a battalion, so they they push you down to the to a company. And I got uh I got pushed down to a uh, golf company because they were next out of the door for deployment. Uh, and then once you get to the company, you know uh, you have an air officer who is a uh, He's a marine captain, so a marine captain pilot, and then you'd have uh, three other JTACs. Well, actually, two other JTACs. So all together with the air officer and three JTACs, you have four, and then each one of the enlisted JTACs goes to teams one, two, or three. Um, how many teams and usually are there? In a, I don't know if you're allowed to say how many teams are in a company usually. There's three. Three teams. Okay. Yeah. So well, technically, there's four. Because the zero number is for the headquarters. Gotcha. Which the headquarters does op- can operate as a as a team to a certain extent. Really, that seems very interesting to have your company HQ out on the field. Running yeah. And running. Yeah. Well, I mean, they, I mean, sometimes they have their own area of responsibility, which you know entails you know meeting with uh, yeah, you know, local leaders lines. and things like that. And so. So. They've got their own little area they're fielding. So you, you get assigned as team two. What was that like your first day walking through the uh, the doors? To uh, new team? I'll be honest with you. Everyone and everyone like at the company buildings, everyone was pretty much deployed or out of school. So when I went there, it was basically empty. Wow. There was like one <laughs> or two people walking around, and I'm like, "Hey, is there anyone here from golf company?" And they're like, "Uh." Yeah, there was somebody here, but you know they they went home early. <laughs> so I'm like, I uh, mean, who's the boss? Uh, you know, at that point. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm like, okay, so I guess I'll just uh, I'll just come back tomorrow then, and see if anybody's around. Wow, that's that's awesome. Uh, but then, but yeah, even at like the company level, you don't have anything to do. So you know, once you got to your team, then you can link up with your team and figure out, you know, well, what training are they doing? And I happened to show up at the time where everybody was, uh, it was the schooling phase, so everybody was going out to these different schools, you know, scout sniper school, blah, 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 this and that. Uh, so everybody was kind of scattered to the winds. Okay. Yeah, I mean, you try to get all those special qualifications. That's what makes Marsoc so special, I guess, is everyone can do a whole big variety of things. Um, so, like, who's the first person on your team that you met? Jeez, who's the first person? Like, me... I guess the first person that made an impression. Yeah. Right? Oh, uh, that oh my helps. God. Uh, I'm I'm gonna say it was either it was either Rob Gilbert or it may have been George or Billy, because I remember when I first met him, like I went I went to the team room. And there's like these two guys there, and I, I I said something, and they were both sergeants, and I'm a staff star, I'm a staff sergeant. And I kind of got the vibe there, like who the fuck is this staff sergeant walking in here, not knowing who I was, or you know, really not knowing anything. <laughs> like, what is he and doing I, here? It's like, uh, 
hey, is this Team 2? Like, yeah, motherfucker, this is Team 2. <laughs> <laughs> so just, just a completely different, you know, a completely different vibe. Like, like you're, you're not welcomed until you've proven, you know, that, that you belong. It's a, it's a whole, it's a whole different creature. Yeah, it's, a, it's a whole brotherhood there. You gotta, you gotta prove you're one of them. Um, I, w- I always find it funny you see on, you know, a lot of media, the impression people get of like special operations, special forces guys that they're all like, you know, six five, two fifty pounds of huge muscle and shaved heads and, you know, all that stuff. But I mean, not, not really, man. I, yeah, I mean, that's I the mean, thing. yeah, I'm sure you could attest to it. It's kind of gotten to that. I, I, I actually saw that a lot more. Uh, when I was in like the ODA guys, I mean, some of these ODA guys were just freaking, they were massive. I'm like, man, I, how are you so big? <laughs> uh, and then, you know, even with, even with our guys that, I mean, our guys were always pressing themselves to be, they wanted to get really big cause they saw how big the, you know, the ODA guys were, were getting, uh, but yeah, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's all different variants. What, what you'll find is, is endurance is a, is a huge thing uh and it was even like that in field artillery like field artillery guys were usually pretty skinny wiry guys but you know they, they could just go for hours and hours uh so yeah you, you run the gamut but yeah hollywood likes the big you know stocky operator right fucking you know meathead fucking no neck guy <laughs> no neck uh yeah i mean it's always people you don't really expect sometimes when you look at them I usually find like because I, I know some people who uh, who who served in uh, the, those different types of branches, and it's usually like when you look at them in the eyes, and they have that look. You know what I mean? That uh, the you know, it's, the it's sometimes look. you know, and 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 it's it's also weird also because you know, there's we're still Marines, so you still have to fall within Marine regulations. Right. Uh, and you know, sometimes it doesn't allow for that. But you know, I was there you know years ago, so. I'm sure things have changed and adapted. Um, so what was your first, I guess, impression of, of being out? I'm sure you know you did trainings with the team and stuff like that. What, what was your first, like, uh, when we, training when, like? When we got out, when we when we deployed out to, uh, so we went out west to do our, our familiarization training as a team. So basically that was like the first time we got to work together as a team. And uh, I remember, like, as soon as we got in our vehicles... And we drove away from our company and we're like heading to a range or heading out to a, you know, a, a maneuver range or something like that. I remember like everybody unblousing their boots. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, okay, nobody's looking. Unblouse your boots. Uh, yeah, it's just, it, it, it was just, it's a totally different experience from, you know, being just a regular, you know, being in regular straight infantry, uh, you know, type of Marine atmosphere. It's uh it's a lot. It's like I said before. It's it's big boy rules. Uh, you know, do your job, do it well, and then you can get away with a lot of shit. <laughs> um, yeah, that sounds like uh, pretty much how I kind of expected it. You know what I mean? It's like as long as you do it and you're the best at doing it, then uh, you know, good for you. Um, we can take a quick break, real quick, and then we'll uh, get back with more with Mr. Michael Golombeski.